Yosemite, land of giants. A wilderness of wild extremes. This is like, like being right under the lip of a breaking wave. Of towering stone and thundering water. A place of splitting earth and saturated air. There's just overwhelming force, overwhelming force. Where nature's law reigns supreme. Many come to the land of giants, but few experience its wild heart. This is the wilderness and the wildness of Yosemite. Yosemite is a crown jewel of America's wild spaces. This stunning valley, a mere seven miles long, contains some of the most awe-inspiring and recognizable wonders of the world. El Capitan and its majestic partner, Half Dome. Yosemite Falls, 13 times higher than Niagara. The giant sequoia, a species as tall as a 30-story building, its trunk wider than many city streets. No living thing in the known history of the planet has ever matched it for size. Yosemite lies in the granite heart of California's mighty Sierra Nevada mountain range. This land of giants was forged by four titanic forces of nature. Fire. Out of the flames, life comes to this wilderness. I believe and feel that they are breathing a sigh of relief from this fire and this burn. Air. Where heaven and earth meet, humans venture at their peril. A tremendous bright flash and this huge explosion. Earth. An awesome ancient pressure breaks out of solid stone. Please don't move. And water. It changes Yosemite every day, every minute, every second. This is the way Yosemite Valley changes shape. We'll come face to face with the power of fire, air, earth, and water to reveal Yosemite's wild side. We'll follow paths few ever take from its most remote corners to its death-defying heights. Lincoln Els is taking on one of the most difficult and dangerous rock climbs in the world, to the summit of El Capitan. A single chunk of granite, more than half a mile high, twice as tall as the Empire State Building. One of the highest unbroken cliffs in the world. 
More than three million visitors gaze at it every year. Few experience it like this. El Cap requires an expert hand. Lincoln is a world-class climber. On this journey, he'll take us with him. This climb is part extreme sport, part science. Lincoln's guide, an intimate knowledge of El Cap's geology. Whoa, listen to that. That's the noise you don't want to hear as a climber. It's loose. What now towers above Lincoln was once the fiery heart of an immense volcano. 100 million years ago, massive bubbles of magma rose into a huge chamber five miles beneath the surface of the Earth. That magma cooled into a single gigantic slab of granite, 350 miles long, 60 miles wide, and 10 miles thick. As water erodes the overlying rock, the granite rises. We see parts of it today, as El Capitan and Yosemite's other great stone sentinels. It'll take Lincoln and his support climber, Chris McNamara, three days to reach the summit of El Cap, if nothing goes wrong. I'm going to slip in, and we can chow down. You want to race that corner? <laughs> yeah, once I get in. Oh, I've got big wall hands. Oh, I could send that. What could go wrong <laughs> is Yosemite's most unpredictable natural force, the weather the power of the Earth's atmosphere, the power of air. Yosemite's great granite monoliths are so high, they attract lightning. In spring and summer, fierce electrical storms charge up Yosemite's valley. They collide with its domes and peaks. These giant granite formations intensify this power of the air. They create the stage for some of nature's most spectacular shows of force. Bursts of lightning. Five times hotter than the surface of the sun. Our next journey into Yosemite takes us to one of its deadliest days. July 27, 1985, five men set out on a hike made by thousands of visitors to Yosemite every year. Their destination is five miles down the valley from El Capitan, the summit of the park's tallest granite peak, the towering Half Dome. Nearly 5,000 feet high, It's a 10-hour trek that requires no special expertise. These men don't realize their target is the top of a gigantic natural lightning rod. To the south of Yosemite, a huge electrical storm forms. On this day, Adrian Esteban was one of the lead hikers. It was predominantly a, a blue sky with just one little cloud way off in the background. Adrian had hiked Yosemite before, but he'd never seen its wild side. We're hiking along, and we got about the halfway point. We noticed the cloud is getting closer into the valley, and now it's getting darker and darker. By late afternoon, they're on the exposed face of Half Dome. Within an hour, they will be the only hikers left on the rock. Now they can hear thunder and see lightning in the distance. 
something about the lightning. The excitement of it all just kind of drove us to go on. A single thunderstorm can contain more energy than 10 atomic bombs. For the instant in which it strikes, a bolt of lightning releases enough power to supply the entire United States. It can pack a fatal blow in the blink of an eye. Bob Magic wrote a book about this fateful day, Shattered Air. Anyone who was in and around Yosemite that day felt that the thunder was the loudest they've ever heard. The reverberations on the ground, on the granite, were the uh, most extreme they've ever felt. Despite the storm, Adrian Esteban and his friends reached the summit. Their showdown with Yosemite seems to have gone their way. And we saw lightning, lightning coming closer, hitting the mountains, surrounding mountains, and it was just awesome. Then the storm slams into Half Dome. It unleashes its full force over the Great Rock. The five men on the summit are caught in one of nature's most terrifying events. Escape is now impossible. Desperate, they seek shelter in a rock enclosure. But it's too late. I felt uh, my skin tingling, tingling sensation. I felt like my hair was standing on end. And that's when the lightning bolt hit. A tremendous bright flash and this huge explosion. The summit takes a direct hit. Millions of volts of electricity arc over the west stone surface into the rock enclosure. Lightning strike kills two of Adrian's friends. Two others suffer massive internal injuries and third-degree burns. They will take years to heal. Adrian was in motion when the lightning struck. Because little of his body was in contact with the rock, he did not ground the lightning's electrical charge, and he escaped with minor injuries. I just want to impress on people that the dangers of nature, how strong, how unpredictable it can be. You have to respect it. Man is no match for nature in all its awesome power. Yosemite is a stage where the awesome power of nature plays the lead role. Lincoln Elf has a seat in the balcony. He's precariously poised high up the face of El Cap. Above him, nothing but sheer stone and clear air. Lincoln has witnessed the terrifying power of Yosemite storms. They pack a one-two punch of force that helps shape this wilderness. Not only do they bring lightning, but water, millions and millions of gallons. If stone is Yosemite's body, water is its soul. What most visitors see are Yosemite's towering waterfalls. including North America's highest, Yosemite Falls, a two and a half thousand foot drop. Beyond the public spectacle, water is Yosemite's engine of change. 
all that water works on Yosemite stone. It erodes the surface. Eventually, that allows the release of pressure. Ancient pressure trapped when the granite cooled from molten. The magma that formed present-day Yosemite cooled under an immense load, billions of tons of overlying rock. That weight trapped pressure in the granite like a clenched fist. Over the course of 80 million years, the huge slab rose as the earth above it was eroded away. As it reached the surface, the action of water helped release the pressure trapped within the stone. The first sign of that pressure release, cracks. The same cracks Lincoln uses on the face of El Cap. These cracks are his ladder to the top. Their life is all about geology right now. Greg Stock is Yosemite's geologist. Those cracks uh, are helping to define sheets of rock that are loosening from the cliff face. In Yosemite, nothing is fixed in stone. Above and around Lincoln, massive sections of the rock face slowly split away. This splitting process can take millions of years. but the rock can break loose at any second. So the rock on this route is great, except for this section. That noise means this whole thing's not very well attached. For Lincoln, this is not just a rock climb. It's a geology test. He can't afford to fail. One of El Cap's most dramatic geological features is the awesome Texas Flake. It's been splitting away from the face for thousands of years. Neither Lincoln else nor Greg Stock really know what holds it on. From the ground, it certainly looks loose. It looks like the kind of thing that would fall. Um, there's no telling when it, it will do so. Lincoln works his way slowly around the Great Flake. He's over 2,000 feet up. Oh, boy. That's as high as a 200-story skyscraper. Now he begins to climb between Texas Flake and the sheer face. Few people get to experience geology like this, up close and personal. The whole thing's just split away from the wall. Just Sitting here, a couple million pounds, who knows. Please don't move. Only 10 years ago, something as big as Texas Flake did come loose, and the result was catastrophic. Six fifty two PM, July tenth, nineteen ninety six. Without warning, two colossal slabs of granite break free of Yosemite's glacier point and fall two and a half thousand feet. Together, the slabs are the size of two football fields and weigh more than a hundred thousand tons. They slam into the valley floor at over two hundred miles per hour. It happened in July. It happened um, in, in clear skies, warm temperatures. The 
air beneath the falling slabs is super compressed and blasts out from the impact point, hurling dust and debris 2,000 feet up. So this, this air blast followed by this huge dust cloud just swept out over this area and just obliterated the forest here. The blast of air alone caused this tree damage. At 300 miles an hour, it was as powerful as the most devastating tornado. It snapped a thousand trees like twigs, some up to half a mile away. Yosemite's towering slabs of granite continued to rise and crack. It's not a question if more giant pieces will break away, but a matter of when. Wedged behind Texas Flake, Lincoln Else can only hope that whatever's keeping this giant slab attached to the face keeps it there just a little while longer. No permit is required to climb El Capitan. It's accessible to all who dare. But right now in Yosemite, an entirely unique climb is underway. 10 miles from El Cap in the back country, biologists have rare permission to scale the park's giant sequoias. Their mission may reveal the fate of the largest living thing on Earth. This is the first study in Yosemite to occur in giant sequoia crowns. Scientist Jim Spickler and his team have come here to the Tuolumne Grove of giant sequoias to search for answers about global warming. The forces that control Yosemite may be tipping out of balance. To find out, they need to look in the canopy of the giant sequoias. They may look indestructible, but they're not. Trees this huge require an incredible amount of water that has to be pumped 300 feet straight up. But global warming may cause the water they depend on to dry up. Jim and his team must collect foliage from the very tops of the sequoias. These samples will help them study how well the trees pump water from the ground. The sequoia's pumping system is driven by a solar engine. Evaporation through its foliage sucks a continuous column of water up its trunk like an immense drinking straw. Every day, a single sequoia pumps a ton of water 300 feet straight up every day without pause for thousands of years. It's a hydraulic system more durable and efficient than anything ever designed by man. Jim begins to rig three of the sequoias. He has to shoot a guide rope over one of the tree's topmost branches. They're hidden by foliage 300 feet above. Dream. An ideal shot over an upper limb. It looks like a perfect rig you have on that tree. Now they must rig. What they're about to climb is as tall as a 27-story building. The sequoias are one of Yosemite's most iconic features, found in few other places on Earth. Fully grown, they weigh around 3,000 tons. They are wider than many city streets. A giant sequoia is also one of the oldest living things on Earth. Some sequoias have been around for some 3,000 years. They were already ancient when Cleopatra reigned in Egypt. Is she ready to go? Yes. It takes Jim and his team a full day to rig the trees. Safety is paramount. A fall from 300 feet will kill you just as surely as a fall from 3,000.
Once in the canopy, the team's lead botanist, Anthony Ambrose, calls the shots. It's his research at the University of California, Berkeley, that guides this expedition. One of the first places that the uh, tree's going to experience the effects of climate change is at the treetops, and that's why it's so valuable for us to be able to get up here and, and study what's going on actually in the trees themselves, because you're not gonna be able to answer these types of questions from the ground. The team collects foliage samples from the topmost branches because this foliage is the engine for nature's greatest water pump. Uh, I think these trees are, are, are just unsurpassed on the planet. They're, they're magnificent. In a portable laboratory 250 feet above the ground, Anthony and Jim test the rate of evaporation from their samples. Step on your ledge here, please. Okay, they try to find out what will happen to the Sequoia's solar pumping system when the sun is hotter and the soil is drier, because that's the predicted yep. effect of global warming. If there's too much evaporation and too little water, the Sequoia solar pump could burn out as it tries to suck water that just isn't there. In this worst case global warming scenario, the water column inside the sequoias will break and the trees perish. We have to make sure that we preserve their habitat now. For now, their treetop field work in Yosemite is done. But it'll be months, maybe years, before this research is complete. Their greatest challenge is to assess the risk from global warming before it's too late. High on the face of El Capitan, Lincoln Else faces his most daunting challenge. El Capitan is one of the world's greatest rock climbs thanks to its system of snaking cracks. They're formed as the pressure trapped within the stone breaks out. The gigantic Texas flake releases some of the pressure in this section of El Cap as it splits from the wall. That makes the rock face around it smooth, too smooth to climb, even for an expert. The crack system Lincoln Else has followed upwards runs out. This has got to be one of the crazier parts on El Cap. You finish Texas Flake, crack runs out, and we got to make it over to the next crack system. Since we can't climb it, we got to swing it. So I'm down at the end of the line. I'm going to go for a little ride. Here we go. Swinging, Chris. Lincoln will now attempt one of rock climbing's most spectacular maneuvers. Yosemite climbers call it the king swing. He's 1,500 feet up, hanging on 100 feet of rope. Lincoln must swing backwards and forwards along the rock face if he's to reach the next crack system. <laughs> Each swing builds greater momentum and brings him closer and closer to the crack system that leads to the summit. Finally, he lands. Now, a new set of geological challenges.
500 feet above him is a forbidding overhang of rock called the Great Roof. This massive geological scar will be Lincoln's last major barrier to the top. It means another night on the face with the ever-present risk of a climber's nightmare, an electrical storm. Lightning may be one of nature's most powerful and deadly forces, but drawn down to the earth of Yosemite, it's also a life giver. Lightning starts 88% of all of Yosemite's wildfires. But this wilderness needs fire to survive. Fire lights our next journey into Yosemite. And our guide is Yosemite's fire specialist, Tara Pacina. This fire will consume 70 acres of forest, as big as 68 football fields. But it wasn't started by lightning. It was deliberately started by a man. Don't you? Taro is that man. For most of the last century, Naturally occurring fires in Yosemite were put out whenever they started. The result was an incredible buildup of dead wood and undergrowth, which fueled catastrophic infernos. Now National Park firefighters play catch up. They manage and allow naturally occurring fires to burn or set controlled fires like this. Taro and his specialist team clean out excess dead wood and recycle valuable nutrients back into the soil. We can't let all fires burn, and we can't put all fires out. We have to find that medium, but understand that fire is vital and important part of our ecosystem. This fire has special significance and special risks because it's burning in one of the most historically important few square miles of all Yosemite. The Mariposa Grove of giant sequoias, Yosemite's largest remaining stand of these great trees. This grove was one of the main reasons President Lincoln took time out from the Civil War to declare Yosemite a protected place in 1864. During the decades when it was policy to stop fires at all costs, barely a single new sequoia sprouted. Why was an enduring mystery, finally solved late last century. Giant sequoias depend on fire to reproduce. The heat opens their seed cones. Their seeds are released. The flames clear the earth for their germination. Copy, Jeff. Yeah, it looks like uh, you and Anson have a really nice uh, line of ignition. Taro flies reconnaissance as the fire moves into Mariposa Grove. Looks like uh, it is burning a little bit more actively in that second segment. Uh, is that what you're seeing on the ground? While lesser trees blaze around them, the giant sequoias stand virtually unscathed by the flames. They're remarkably fire resistant. Their bark is the thickest of any tree on earth, up to two feet, and their sap contains a high percentage of the fire retardant chemical, tannin. You can look at the fire scars at the base of the sequoias. They've seen fire for eons, and they will continue to see it if we have anything to do about it. Tyro and his fire team work to bring the natural forces that sustain Yosemite back into balance. 
fire is a vital part of life here. When the flames die down, the earth is ready for a new generation of giant sequoias. In every corner of the park, Yosemite's rangers and scientists try to restore a balance threatened by man's presence. Tori Sayre is Yosemite's bear specialist. Her mission is to keep Yosemite's bears wild and away from the temptations brought into the park by human visitors. I know that a lot of people, when they think of Yosemite bears, they do think of those bears going through the campsites and parking lots and think of, you know, the bad bears. They're not bad bears. They're bears out there trying to uh, make a living and find food. For wild bears to stay wild, they need natural food, particularly acorns, one of nature's highest calorie foods. That's where Yosemite's fire policy plays its role in the bear's survival. Fire clears the canopy and allows sunlight for young oak trees to grow. Forest needs fire. It allows new growth, and with that um, comes more of a natural food supply for bears. Tori's research shows that more and more bears trade Yosemite's car parks and campgrounds for its wild spaces and their overall numbers are increasing. We know we have a healthy population of bears here. We are starting to uh, get more and more sightings of bears in areas of the park where we, we've never had bear sightings before. But Yosemite's human guardians cannot protect it from what happens beyond its borders. Evidence is mounting that climate change, global warming, is upsetting the natural forces that have kept Yosemite in balance for eons. Finding undisturbed nature, even in Yosemite, is a challenge greater than ever. Two thousand feet up. Lincoln Els is on his final push to the summit of El Capitan. This daunting overhang is known as the Great Roof. It's all that's left of a single column of rock that's been breaking away from the face of El Capitan for at least 10,000 years. And right now, it's Lincoln Els' last geological barrier on his climb to the top. This is like, like being right under the lip of a breaking wave. It's amazing. Oh. The Great Roof exists because of immense glaciers that once filled Yosemite Valley. Over a series of great ice ages that ended 10,000 years ago, Glaciers bulldoze through Yosemite to create sheer vertical cliffs. When the glaciers retreated, pressure trapped within the stone pushed directly outwards, breaking entire columns of rock away. The great roof is all that remains of one of those columns. This is the balancing act that's involved in climbing El Cap. Nice bed. Okay. 
same thing again. Coming out into the wind. The great glaciers that helped shape El Cap have long fled the valley. But glaciers have not entirely left Yosemite. Twenty miles from Lincoln, in a rarely visited part of the park, Yosemite's last significant glacier fades like an old memory. Lyle Glacier is 11,000 feet up the bare slope of Mount Lyle at the head of a remote canyon. Geologist Greg Stock treks into Yosemite's past to look for answers about its future. All over the world, glaciers retreat. They provide some of our most dramatic evidence of global warming. So it is in Yosemite. Greg chases a glacier that shrinks faster and faster up the mountain as temperatures become warmer. Best estimates are that in 50 to 75 years, this glacier will be essentially gone. Global warming isn't the only external force that threatens Yosemite. The drift of aerial pesticides from outside the park has helped push one of Yosemite's most abundant creatures to the brink of extinction the mountain yellow-legged frog. In Yosemite's alpine meadows, the park's chief wildlife biologist, Steve Thompson, is on a lonely search for the frogs that once abounded here. We're talking about millions of animals that have been reduced to, I don't, even want to speculate how few we have, because we're just finding out how few we have. 10 years ago, mountain yellow-legged frogs were the most numerous amphibians in the Sierra Nevada range. Their numbers have plummeted by 95%. And the glacial ponds and lakes of Yosemite are one of their last refuges. People have this image of a national park being held inviolate protected. But unless there is change, immediate change and big change, they're likely to lose a lot of the things that they hold dear here in Yosemite. Half a mile straight up El Capitan, Lincoln's over the lip of the great roof. He closes in on the summit. Few people on Earth have experienced Yosemite the way he has. Whew, a little windy up here. It doesn't get much more exposed than that. Whoa. To those who only see the postcard views, Yosemite seems an ancient and unchanging place. beauty frozen in stone and framed by its great cascades. Our journeys into Yosemite have shown it's anything but unchanging. And its beauty is actually far more fragile than it looks. From the time humans first set foot in this extraordinary wilderness, it's been a place of wonder and inspiration. Woo. What a crazy place. The more we understand about the forces that created Yosemite, the more we understand our responsibility to it.
beyond Earth, air, fire, and water. Man is now the power shaping Yosemite. Oh. <laughs> the last flake. <laughs> Just topped out. Its future is in our hands. <laughs>